Welcome everyone to this ICME webinar on the recent developments in the EU sustainable finance for the US-based ECMA members. We are here today with Nicola Paff, who is the head of sustainable finance and secretary to the Green Bonds principles. Nicholas is also a member of the EU Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance. We'll be conducting this webinar today. Before we start, here are some guidelines for all participants. You will see at the very bottom of your screen a Q&A box, which will be made available for you throughout the whole um, presentation, where you can type your question, which will then be addressed at the end of the presentation. Please note that you'll be all be muted throughout the whole presentation. For those dialed in through the phone, you can send questions to the following emails or type in the box at the right hand side of your screen. Um, questions will be answered at the very end of a presentation by Nicholas. And um, now I will let Nicholas kick off. Uh, the floor is all yours, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Ludovic, and, and welcome to, to all of you. Uh, in particular, those of you who are dialing in from, from North America, but also there may be um, many other of you who are dialing from other uh, geographies. Um, of course, um, I will proceed with, uh, the, uh, with the webinar um, and discuss the important topic of recent developments in EU sustainable finance. So I hope that, that all of you um, can see the, the presentation, the, 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 the short presentation that we've prepared. I'm going to um, take you through it. So starting with the um, first slide, um, I wanted to give you a, a quick overview on the EU's Sustainable Finance Action Plan with this slide. Um, we don't have the time to go into detail of, of all of this, but I think it's interesting to illustrate how the ambition of the EU Action Plan for Sustainable Finance uh, is to, to uh, impact all market participants and across the different aspects of the market and um, of uh, finance generally. Um, there are three overriding objectives, which you can see at the bottom of the slide, reorienting capital flows towards sustainable investment, mainstreaming sustainability into risk management, and three, fostering transparency and long-termism. Now, um, when the um, EU uh, uh, is, was, uh, started the implementation of this, uh, of this plan, there are certain aspects which uh, went directly into um, the legislation path uh, and others which were uh, delegated for further advice and recommendations or, or complementary technical aspects. And um, this was this this uh, uh, non-legislative work was delegated to a group which was constituted for that purpose, and that's uh, perhaps unsurprisingly referred to as the technical expert group uh, on sustainable finance. Um, and I have the uh, uh, the privilege of representing the uh, uh, ICMA, but also the uh, agreement on principles and social uh, bond principles uh, community. Um, and of, of uh, doing my utmost to provide a voice for, for, for our markets in that, uh, in that context. Now, the technical expert group was set up in June uh, 2018 with uh, 35 core members and a, a number of observers. Um, it, uh, um, its mandate uh, runs formally until September 2020, but the substance of the work was actually completed um, in March 2020, so, so very recently. There were, there were four uh, key deliverables for this group. One relates to the EU taxonomy, the other to the EU green bond standard. I'm going to uh, focus in this presentation on those two, but for your information, there was also very important work done on EU climate benchmarks and benchmarks ESG disclosures. Uh, that was contained in a report as of September 2019. And there were also very important recommendations with respect to climate-related disclosures, and that was contained in an early report in January 2019. Now, I'm going to spend um, some time on, on, on this slide um, and talk to you about the EU taxonomy. Um, 
the the EU taxonomy is uh, is a number of things. Um, it is at the core a list of economic activities that are considered environmentally sustainable for investment purposes. These economic activities are classified based, on, in fact, on a statistical system which is uh, in use um, by the uh, by the European Commission um, and the European Union for, for, for many years um, uh, in relation to their own economic work. And that's referred to as the uh, NACE, uh, which is a French acronym uh, uh, of um, uh, four economic activities. And so the, uh, the taxonomy refers to these statistical categories. Now, um, this, this list of economic activities that are considered sustainable, um, the first test is that they substantially contribute to at least one of the six environmental objectives uh, defined by the, um, the, um, the European Commission. Uh, those are unsurprisingly climate change mitigation, adaptation, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources, transition to a circular economy, including waste prevention and recycling, pollution prevention and control, and last but not least, protection of healthy ecosystems. Um, now, these uh, uh, economic activities um, then have to comply also, and unsurprisingly, with quantitative and qualitative technical screening criteria. Um, this is something which is at the core of the taxonomy and what it does is that it provides a fairly binary test as to whether an economic, economic activity is considered sustainable and this goes down to a fairly granular level um, to illustrate it would be for example um, uh, a technical criteria in relation to um, uh, uh, energy efficiency for buildings or it could be criteria for manufacturing processes including in, in industries which are considered uh, fairly brown, such as the, the, the cement industry. Now, you may have thought that, that that's it, that that's what the taxonomy does, and then it you know, focuses on, on environmental objectives and technical criteria. But um, actually, the taxonomy has, has um, one other very important dimension and a cross-cutting uh, test. The very important additional criteria is the compliance with minimum safeguards. And these minimum safeguards are actually social safeguards. And they refer to, um, unsurprisingly, to EU uh, environmental and social laws. Um, and they also refer to international standards such as the treaties of the International Labour Organization. Uh, and in this respect, therefore, the, the, the taxonomy is, you know, shouldn't be considered just an environmental uh, taxonomy, but it's, it is very much a sustainability taxonomy. Now, I refer to, to cross-cutting criteria. This is the do no significant harm uh, methodology. Uh, indeed, the taxonomy requires that um, a cross-cutting look uh, be, be given to the, uh, the, the lack of significant harm or contradiction to, um, for example, other, you know, other um, uh, environmental criteria. If, for example, you had a project which aimed at climate change mitigation, you would need to also consider that you are not harming healthy ecosystems or that you know when you are rolling out your climate change mitigation uh, project, for example, that you are uh, aligned with these minimum social safeguards. So this is a, a very comprehensive uh, classification system, and because it is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, very embedded from a social point of view uh, uh, in relation to EU social criteria in EU uh, uh, social law, I would argue that it, it gives a very strong European dimension to the overall uh, EU taxonomy. Now, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, the um, 
TEG uh, makes recommendations on technical aspects, but that there's also a legislative path with respect to the implementation of the EU action plan. Uh, this is specifically, this is especially true of the taxonomy, which is both being implemented as a legislative initiative with a law which should be uh, voted uh, in, the, in the coming weeks or months, as well as the technical work, which I have uh, referred to, to earlier. Now, we expect that the, uh, the legislation that will come into to force once voted will reflect the political agreement which was reached by the uh, European uh, Commission, Council and, and Parliament uh, at the end of last year. And what this uh, political agreement reflects is, is one agreement on the overall uh, uh, construction of the, of the taxonomy, the different aspects which I've, I've described, but it also added additional aspects to, to the taxonomy. And there are two uh, that I would like to, to focus on. The first one is that the taxonomy legislation in itself is now going to require large uh, companies in Europe that are under the scope of another uh, legislation, piece of legislation, which is the NFRD, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, are going to be required to disclose information in relation to the alignment of their economic activities and their uh, investments uh, in relation to the EU taxonomy. Uh, the uh, taxonomy regulation is also going to require manufacturers of financial products to provide disclaimers in relation to products which do not align with the EU taxonomy. So it's a kind of a negative test. It's not just when you are marketing a financial product which is purporting to be uh, sustainable. Uh, it also, you know, there is a negative criteria that is coming into play through the, the need for disclaimers for certain types of financial products. Now, coming back to the, the technical work of the TEG in relation to the taxonomy, the final report of the uh, TEG on this topic was released in March 2020, and it picks up, one, the status of the political agreement, which I just mentioned. It provides an explanation of how climate adaptation activities are, are defined, and this was important because the prior work was focusing on mitigation. It gives guidelines on how to implement do no significant harm to make it um, as practical as possible, in particular with a focus on, on due diligence and, and processes. Um, and it also provides uh, guidance for disclosures for entities subject to NFRD. Um, so picking up the topic I mentioned on the previous slide. And then last but not least, it has a very large technical annex, which provides technical criteria for 70 climate change mitigation and 68 climate change adaptation activities. Now, I'm now going to switch to the uh, EU green bond standard. Um, there's been, um, I think, some, some concern about, about this specific effort, particularly in relation to those of you who are active in the, already active in the green bond market. And I think the first thing that, that I would like to underline is that the EU GBS is not currently on a legislative track. Uh, so it's not like the taxonomy. There isn't a piece of legislation which is uh, um, impending. It is still very much a recommendation, a technical, technical recommendation of the expert group. Um, this doesn't mean that there may not ultimately be a piece of legislation in relation to, to the EU GBS, but that is not what the TEG is saying. The TEG is saying that there should be, that it should be a, a voluntary standard, which issuers can elect to align with, but there would be no obligation. So we're not going to be, we don't have a recommendation which says that all green bonds issued in, in Europe need to align with the standard. Um, you would still be able to do a GBP aligned bond and then also an EU GBS uh, bond. But again, I'd like to underline that this is just a recommendation at this stage from the TEG and the commission still has to decide what it's going to do. Now, the other thing that, that is important to, to, to bear in mind is that what is being proposed is very close to existing market practice and to what um, is already in the GBP. Uh, there are, uh, there's obviously um, 
uh, more detail in some aspects, particularly in terms of the role of a green bond framework. There is unsurprisingly the recommendation for an alignment of all EU GBS projects with the EU taxonomy. There is more detail in the type of allocation reports in terms and also of the impact reports that are required. But most importantly, there is a requirement for systematic verification of uh, the EU GBS, both upfront with respect to the alignment of the framework with the um, uh, EU GBS, and then with respect to the final allocation report. So the EU GBS differs fundamentally, I would argue, from the GBP in, the, in that it is a systematically verified standard. Um, and I'll come back to a comparison between the EU GBS and the GBP uh, before finishing. Now, the most recent publication um, uh, with respect to the EU GBS by the TG just came out in March. Uh, and this important document is called the Usability Guide. And this, its main content focuses on how an issuer could align its uh, EU green bond projects with EU taxonomy. So it's practical advice, how to build a green bond framework, templates for reporting requirements, and also a, um, a discussion on how uh, verifiers can uh, work in this, uh, um, uh, in the context of the UGBS. And picking up the theme of the, uh, uh, of the UGBS being a systematically verified standard, it, it confirms a, a, a key aspect, which is that um, verifiers, that the recommendation for verifiers are that ultimately they be supervised by the European Market Authority, uh, ESMA. But as that might take time, because ESMA would need to have legislative powers to do this, a potential interim registration scheme would be put in place to bridge uh, the time uh, needed for, the, for ESMA to acquire supervisory powers for verifiers. And this interim registration scheme would be managed by participants in the TEG. Again, this is just a recommendation, but it's important to note that because the EU GBS would not be able to be implemented until there would be registration of verifiers. The other key takeaways from this report is, uh, again, the confirmation of the recommended voluntary nature of the UGBS, uh, the recognition of its de facto alignment with the GBP. Uh, there is um, uh, recommendations in terms of flexibility for alignment of projects uh, under the EU taxonomy in complex cases or in cases where technical criteria is not available. And then there's a framing of the requirements for verification uh, of the alignment with EU taxonomy qualitative criteria, but also the, the do no significant harm tests. And again, there, the threshold that is being recommended is one where there is a focus on due diligence and on appropriate processes. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm going to finish this presentation with a uh, comparison of the GBP and the GBS, and I'm gonna repeat some of the key messages. So um, again, both the EU GBS and GBP are voluntary standards or elective standards. The applicability of the, of the GBP, as you know, is global. I would argue that because of the alignment, uh, required alignment with the EU taxonomy, the EU GBS is more of a regional standard with international relevance. They both refer to use of proceeds bonds. The EU GBS integrates the GBP in its four core components, but uh, requires alignment with EU taxonomy formalizes the green run framework and provides for more granular reporting. So I've already mentioned that. And then external reviewers, again, the very important point that in the GBP, it is highly recommended, but remains voluntary. While in the case of the UGBS, it is mandatory for alignment with the green run framework and allocation reporting. It is voluntary for impact reporting, but last but not least, it is a requirement that the verifiers be first registered and then uh, supervised potentially by, uh, by ESMA. Now, uh, to finish, the next steps are that the uh, Commission will launch uh, shortly a new consultation on its sustainable finance strategy that will include uh, a request for comments on the proposals around EU GBS. The taxonomy regulation on the other hand is already uh, uh, near to be implemented. 
Uh, we expect delegated acts in 2020 for climate change mitigation and adaptation and in 2021 for other environmental objectives. And the EU GBS, uh, at the moment, we don't have a deadline, but we can ex expect that there either there will be commission support for the TEG recommendations in the form, for example, of what is referred to as a communication in 2020. Alternatively, there should be some form of EU regulation in 2021, but again, with no current prospects of the UGBS becoming a mandatory standard. So that is what I, I wanted to cover with this presentation. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to look at the uh, Q&A and see if I can answer some of the uh, questions which you have uh, uh, put to me. Uh, the, um, I'm reading this live, so I, I, I apologize for the lag. I'm just going to have a quick look at what you are uh, uh, asking me. Uh, the first question is, um, how is uh, significant evaluated in, in do no significant harm? Um, th there's, there's no short answer to that. I, I, I think clearly the, um, both in the taxonomy report um, and in the usability guide of the EU GBS, there is guidance in terms of how one can uh, start evaluating and working with do do no significant harm. There's a number of, of, of criteria and tests which are proposed in the taxonomy report, and there is guidance in terms of, of referring to you know, appropriate processes and due diligence in the usability guide. Um, so I, I can't get that much more granular here, but I, I, would, I would concur with the view that, that um, there's a lot of, of practice that needs to be developed around this. And so one should really be looking at the issuers that are going to come to market early with the EU GPS um, and other work which is going to go around uh, looking at um, how one aligns with uh, the, D, the do not significant harm criteria in the EU taxonomy. Um, my, the second question I can see here uh, refers, and again, I apologize for the lag because I'm reading this as we go along. Um, there's a reference to is the uh, in the templates in the GBS uh, comment saying that there is a statement is the green bond or the green bond still in alignment with the EU green bond standard? Um, how can this be? How can this be answered in the report? Um, and does it mean that the bond has been externally certified? Second party is enough verification. Yes, I, I, I think what, what's being asked here is. Um, in the, in the template, there's a requirement for confirming that a, a bond remains over time uh, aligned with the UGBS. Um, and again, there is only a requirement for verification at the beginning and at the end of the life of a bond. And in the meanwhile, the standard is for the issuer uh, to confirm that it believes that it is bond is still aligned with the EU GBS. So I hope that answers that question. Um, I have another question here, which is, is the EU taxonomy and are the Greenman principles the only frameworks that will be used by U.S. issuers as well? I'm not clear on what the market standard framework will be that should be shown to U.S. issuers. I, I think <clears throat> for, you know, for U.S. issuers, but more generally for international issuers, uh, the, the reference will remain uh, primarily the Green Bond principles. I think that the EU taxonomy comes into play if you're an international issuer, one, if you decide that you want to refer to that, uh, uh, to the taxonomy, but if that is, is not something which you have, uh, have decided to do, then the taxonomy is, is most relevant uh, because of the technical criteria it provides on um, sustainability thresholds for economic activities. And that might be particularly relevant if your investors, if you're looking from an, for an issuer perspective and your investors are asking you to, to help them um, uh, look at your projects also taking into account those thresholds. So, you know, I don't think there's any obligation. I don't think you'd have to systematically in any way refer to the EU taxonomy, but you may have to refer to some aspects of the taxonomy if your investors are asking, uh, particularly if your investors are asking it from you because they've decided 
that the EU taxonomy is an important reference point uh, for, uh, for projects in this space. Um, there's another question here with respect to the delay of, of, of ESMA intervening to supervise verifiers. Um, and, this, and it focuses on the, the timing. Um, and indeed, you know, the, the minimum amount of time for, for ESMA to receive legislative powers to supervise uh, verifiers in relation to the EU GBS is most likely up, you know, anything from two and a half to three years, uh, just taking into account the amount of, of time that's required to implement legislation, to vote and implement legislation in the, in the EU. Um, I have another question um, in relation to the international applicability for the EU GBS. I, I think I've already answered that uh, earlier. Now here's an interesting question. It says, you know, are these standards for is US issuers issuing in Euro? No, it's not a question of you know, you have to align with the standard if you're issuing in, in, in Euro. Um, it is, again, it's designed to be an elective standard. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have to see what the Commission uh, decides to do in fine with respect to, to the EU GBS. There's only a recommendation for the time being. Uh, but um, uh, I, I would, uh, you know, I would say that that if you are and again, picking up on a comment I made earlier, you know, if you are a U.S. issuer and you're facing, uh, you know, a, a large group of EU investors, they may, you know, once again, they may ask you to provide information in relation to the alignment of your projects with some aspects of the EU taxonomy. Um, and, and primarily because they themselves are going to be an, under an obligation to report on the alignment of their portfolios with the EU taxonomy. So that's where, you know, looking at things internationally, that's where the, the technical criteria and some of the aspects of the EU taxonomy might become international uh, practice. It will come from investor demand. That's, that would be my anticipation. Um, I have a, I feel a granular question on, on uh, uh, on the, the negative tests required, and I think this is in to carry on and, and process as projects. Um, I think it's a bit too granular here. Again, I would, I would refer back to the usability guide and the, and the taxonomy guide. Here, there's, there's a question on, on, on the status of, 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 of verifiers going forward um, and, and how they how they relate to to existing practices. I, I think it's important to understand that that what is being what is going to be asked from external reviewers in relation to the UGBS uh, would be a, a, a quasi certification job. We referred to to verification, but you could also call it certification. And, and there's going to be you know, very clear direction in terms of what needs to be verified. I've mentioned the framework and the allocation report. Um, and that is going to be quite different from, from the existing uh, uh, palette of, um, uh, sorry, of, of array of, of uh, external review practices which, which currently exist. Uh, here's another interesting question um, in relation to, and I, I think I'll only be able to take two or three more of these. Um, the question is, does the concept of sustainability linked bond fit into the definition of an EU green bond standard? Um, not explicitly. Uh, now, as you, as, you, as, you, as you may know, there is no formal guidance yet from, from ICMA um, and the GBP on sustainability linked bond. This is, this is something we're looking at very actively. I think once that guidance is in place, you know, you could conceive of a, a, a green bond which has a, a project focus, i.e. A, a, you know, and a use of proceeds focus, but nonetheless uh, may also have overarching 
uh, um, uh, targets now. So sort of a mix of the two approaches, but that's that's very speculative. So so I would I would argue that you know the, the best answer I can give you is that that at the moment the sustainability linked bonds do not fit in the EU GBS. Uh, here's an interesting question: Is you know can existing green bonds be retroactively verified to the EU GBS? Uh, potentially. Uh, although again, it's it's important to bear in mind that there is no plan and no interest in making the UGBS a retroactive standard. Um, you know, it's it's important that that when the UGBS is implemented, that 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 is a sort of you know ground zero moment, where where uh, we will have a new category of 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 uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of green bonds, and I say that especially because. Um, the you know the taxonomy is going to bring a novel way of of looking at, at at projects, and so it's going to be very difficult, I would argue, to start retroactively evaluating projects in relation to the EU taxonomy. Um, here, I've got a question on you know will external reviews turn into a regulated activity in Europe? Um, and I suppose the answer in relation to the EU GBS is um, yes. You know if if indeed the Commission follows the recommendation of the TEG and verifiers. Uh, come under the, the the supervision of ESMA. Yes, it will be a regulated regulated activity. Um, you know, and the parallel here is it, what's already happening for credit rating agencies. Um, okay, here's an interesting question on asking me to comment whether the taxonomy uh, will be expanded in the future to deal with transition financing. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that that the taxonomy already incorporates uh, a a a filter uh, with respect to to activities that are considered as already contributing to transition, enabling transition, or essentially being a uh, non-transition, if I put it that way, i.e. being brown. So, um, you know, one of the, the aspects of taxonomy, which I didn't comment on is, is, is that, um, and, and you know, you know, in this wider debate in which the GBP is involved and ICMA are involved around climate, transition finance, and we have a dedicated working group for that, the taxonomy will be uh, an important reference point because it provides these categorizations. But there is also a lot more work going on, um, as I mentioned, particularly in our, in our working group on that. And so there will be you know, other, um, other tools and further guidance on, on, on transition. And that you know, most likely will apply to, uh, on the one hand, you know, um, uh, use of pre use of proceeds bonds um, uh, as they already exist, and there's a number of issuers that have already uh, issued green bonds that that refer already to transition themes, and then we have again this whole ongoing reflection about uh, sustainability linked bonds, and you could very well see how you can build a sustainability linked bond which would also have a transition theme. Now, here we have a question on, on, on I know, have central banks expressed any opinions on green bonds? Um, yes, they have. And, and, and as, you, as, you, as many of you may have already seen, uh, for example, the ECB has reported on its investments in, in, in green bonds and on the portfolio it's acquired within um, its uh, asset purchase program, for example. Um, there's also been an interesting initiative of the Bank of International Settlements, which has a a, a, a uh, investment activity in relation to two green bonds, and they refer to to the GBP. It is clear that you know in the European context, uh, official sector uh, market participants, particularly the you know the the uh, euro system and and the European Central Bank, you know may well find a you know the EU GBS is a very uh, important tool to to um, uh, to use when considering investments in, in green bonds, because it would be a, uh, in addition to the market standard that the GBP provides, it would be an official uh, standard. Uh, here's an interesting question of, in relation to how much of the uh, projects have to align fully with all technical criteria, or does the UGBS offer some flexibility? The, the UGBS does provide for flexibility and it, and it does so particularly in areas where you know, either the technical criteria is not um, uh, available or in situations where, where it's just very complicated to, 
uh, refer projects back to economic activities. I mean, one thing I didn't underline, but um, uh, I, I'd like to uh, focus on uh, a bit now is, is, you know, one of the difficulties we face in the sustainable finance uh, world is when you look at the EU taxonomy, the fact that it refers to economic activities based on statistical classifications, that doesn't actually fit into a, a project in the real world. Uh, you know, for example, when you're when you you might be you know rolling out you know uh, more environmentally uh, sustainable processes in a complex manufacturing context, um, and uh, uh, you know a, a, as a result. Uh, you may need that flexibility. We've also referred to situations where, um, with respect to location, you know, it might be challenging to to meet EU criteria, and that that could also refer to um, the social aspects. And and in that respect, um, the the recommendation is that with an external reviewer, uh, you know, an issue would be able to to look at the overarching environmental objectives of the taxonomy, and justify you know, a lack of, 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 of potential alignment in some areas um, with the EU taxonomy because of the overall contribution of the projects to an important environmental objectives. Now it's, you know, this is gonna be case by case and going forward, what we hope is that there may also be the opportunity for issuers in that situation to come back to a, the successor body of the EU technical expert group. Um, there are plans to put in place a body referred to as the platform for sustainable finance uh, you know within the within the commission and it may be possible to have dialogues on on recurring situations such as those thank you very much again for your time thank stay you very safe. much everyone and stay safe indeed